The next paper in this session is entitled Soft, Bioactive, and Durable, Why Polymer Electrodes Can Be Tougher Than, metal, than Metals. The speaker is Maria Absalent from the University of Freiburg. Maria. So that's it. So thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation to come here to Ann Arbor to talk about actually conducting polymers. That's quite an honor because I'm sure many of you know that a lot of the pioneering research on conducting polymers and in particular PDOT for neural interfaces was, was done here in Ann Arbor. So it's quite exciting for me to be able to return and uh, perhaps give some convincing argument for why this is still an exceptionally good material when it comes to neural interfaces. So I'm sure also most of you are familiar with these kind of pictures. This is an overview picture showing all different kinds of devices that have been per, um, fabricated with different microfabrication technologies in order to interface with the nervous system on different levels. So the reason I show this picture is first of all that I want to show there are all these kinds of devices that we want to use and all these devices are really small. But my belief is that in the future, uh, they're going to be even smaller. So either we make the complete device smaller or we want features. So many more electrode sites here representing single channels which we can use to interact in a more precise manner with the nervous system. So no matter how we look at it, we are going to need very small electrodes for the future. This is just to show you one example. This is one of the smallest polyimide probes I've ever worked with. This is a 30 micron wide polyimide shaft. We have been able to make it this thin, so normally they are like 500 micron in width, but this is only 30 micron because we have several layers. So we can have the connection lines here, as you see, going under, more or less under the electrodes if we want to. So the electrodes are at 20 micron in diameter. So what does this mean? So microfabrication wise, this one needs to be good at this to make these small devices. But what it really means is that one needs really excellent materials that goes on the electrode surface. And this is true both when it comes to recording and when it comes to stimulation. Because if one does not have that, one is going to end up with electrodes with high impedance, poor recording quality, poor signal to noise ratio and also low charge injection capacity, possibly even when one wants to stimulate with, with strong signals, some corrosion, meaning the electrode eventually will delaminate or with, by other means corrode away. So it's very important to think about what kind of material we put here on the microelectrodes themselves. And I just put this picture in to show you that it's even I would say this picture here is, is showing the reality better than it sometimes is. This is a real SEM image of a small electrode. This is 12 micron in diameter and has got a five micron polyimide layer on top. So there's an etched edge here. So we see in principle, this electrode sits in the bottom of a deep well. And this is the reality of our recording. So what do we do and what can we do to make this situation better? So to bring possibly the electrode all the way up here to the surface and give it as good electrochemical qualities as possible, both for recording and stimulation. So this is where PDOT comes in. So PDOT is on its own without anyone doing anything additionally, a very nice material for microelectrodes. It's got low impedance. It's got on its own high charge injection capacity. It's not cytotoxic and even without any surface modification, cells like to sit on it because it's extremely hydrophilic. So proteins can, can adhere to the PDOT material and cells can adhere to these proteins. So we see here these are in vitro cultured um, neuro neuroblastoma cells, but there is also plenty of in vivo data in the meantime showing how nice recordings you can make with PDOT microelectrodes. What is also very nice is that you can combine this material with all kinds of devices. So all the devices that I showed in the previous picture, you can coat the electrodes with PDOT because it's an electrode deposition process. So you can do it at the final step of your device fabrication. So you can choose either you can short circuit all electrodes and coat them all at the same time, or as here, you can choose only certain sites and give them a PDOT coating. And what is not 
clear in this picture is that you in fact also can deposit so much pedot so that you fill this deep well in the polyimide device that I showed before. So you can actually already elevate the surface of the electrode so that it is on the very surface of the probe. This is not particularly difficult. So what is the reason pedot is such a cool electromaterial? So if we look from the top, the surface is rough. But if you look at the cross section, we can see it's also a thick electromaterial. And in fact, this full bulk here contributes to the charge transfer. So if you have a fast stimulation signal, like with neurostimulation, most of the action happens still here on the surface. So uh, the surface roughness contributes, but also part of the top layer here of the pilot material. But the slower we go with the signals, the more of the bulk is also activated. So this is an important point in my talk today, that the slower the signal, the more of the bulk can also con contribute to signal transfer. So it's not just a surface roughness effect. It's a material that acts in principle like a sponge. So you can fill it, we can squeeze it to squeeze ions in and soak them into the material and squeeze them out again. So what is the weakness of PDOT? So for a very long time, the real weakness of PDOT electrodes has been the poor adhesion to most metals. So this is just one example. This is PDOT electrode deposit on a smooth platinum surface. And this is an accelerated aging test. So this electrode is immersed in the 60 degrees Celsius PBS. And if you look after the first, a little bit less than 500 hours, we can see that we lost most of the material. So maybe from the impedance recording or from the impedance measurement, this is not so obvious that in principle the electrode is completely broken. So it's very important to have both the imaging and the impedance measurement to see these effects. So in solid numbers, this happens after approximately 150 stress cycles. So when I say a stress cycle, I mean a CV cycle. So we bring the material from its most oxidized to its most reduced state or to be more relevant for neural interfaces, a cycle over the full water window. <coughs> then we see complete delamination, or after 120 million biphasic pulses, or after a little bit more than 400 hours here at 60 degrees in PBS. This is on platinum. If we put P dot instead on top of iridium oxide, we have a bond forming between the two. So this is exceptionally nice, because not only does it mean that we can stress the materials for a very long time. So we have tested up to 10,000 of these cycles over the full water window. The only failure we saw after the 10,000 cycle you can see in this picture. So there's a crack forming here in the middle of the electromaterial. But apart from that, if you look at the impedance from the first to the very last of the 10,000 cycles, so this is an impedance measurement performed after all the 10,000 cycles, there is in principle no change. We have tested up to 10 to the power of nine pulses at two millicoulomb per square centimeter, so it's a fairly high load. Also no change. And in the accelerated aging experiments, we estimate that we have tested uh, approximately one and a half year. But I say this is, we stopped testing because it was not interesting for us anymore, but it wasn't because the material failed. So the very important point of showing this, because one might ask, so if I have iridium oxide, why do I need PDOT? The important point here is that when you have such good adhesion, you can use PDOT for other things. You can use it to put other features on top of your electrode that are not possible if you have weak adhesion between uh, the metal and the PDOT layer on top. So I'll show you a few such examples. So the first example is you can use it as a drug delivery system. So many of you might have seen different versions of this. So we have developed a version for dexamethasone delivery. So the point with this is that we can include dexamethasone in the electrode. And then when a probe is implanted, we can release the dexamethasone in a controlled way. So instead of releasing ions to the neurons, we release a bit of dexamethasone. So we can extend this, we can do it if we want to on a weekly basis. So instead of having a boost of dexamethasone coming out immediately, the idea is that we can have a weekly dose of dexamethasone triggered by one of these cyclic sweeps over the electrode. So in principle, this is different from stimulation. We can still do stimulation with this electrode without doing release. 
So this is a slow sweep that activates the full bulk of the material. We have tested this together with rats and the flexible probes, so not these uh, extremely small flexible probes that I showed you before, but they are much wider. We see them here. So we have these larger electrodes here covered with P-dot decks. And 12 such probes went into, or 24 probes went into 12 rats. And over 12 weeks, on a weekly basis, some of these probes got uh, the stimulation to release an efficient dose of dexamethasone, so to treat the zone around the electrode. And the idea is that we wanted to see if we could reduce the number of in inflammatory markers after 12 weeks, so after a fairly long time. So I'm not going to go into many of the details in the results because there are more things I want to tell you, but I can at least say that the surprise in the study was that flexible probes in general are so good, they do not cause a lot of inflammation, not even these fairly wide probes that we see here. So in fact, this is a cross-section in the tissue of the probe. You can see the electrode side here is a little well in the middle. And here you can see it is autofluorescent, the probe. But you can see there is also tissue very close to the probe. So in fact, our recorded signals did not change essentially over 12 weeks, no matter if there was dexamethasone involved or not. What we could see is that we had a um, lower amount of inflammatory cells around the actively dex-treated probes meaning that there is an effect of dexamethasone this way. And for me, as a PDOT person, the most important outcome was we can use it this way. We can implant PDOT over 12 weeks. We can do cyclic voltammetry in vivo. We can release a drug this way, and we do not see any negative consequences of this. So this was also not certain before the study that one can do such an experiment in the brain of an animal. Because once this is clear, of course, then it's possible to think of other things. So maybe dexamethasone is one idea, but what else do we want to release? So this is another example that we have developed together with Patrick Ruter and uh, Ulrich Egert, who actually would have had this speaking slot today. If I would not have been here, I got his slot, so I'm grateful to him for, for many reasons. One of them is that I, I'm here. Uh, the idea is that we can, instead of dexamethasone, we load the electrodes with a neurotracer. So we use ion exchange to soak in a neurotracer into the electrode. Then the electrode can function over at least 30 days as a recording microelectrode in a mouse brain. And after these 30 days, that's when the experiment is over. So before explanting the probe, now we are talking about a stiff probe. We can release the neurotracer and leave a fluorescent footprint in the tissue, so telling exactly where the electrode was. This might seem like a tiny practical detail, but it appears to me that this is a, a big practical problem for many doing experiments, that it's difficult to correlate your histology after 30 days with your recordings, because you do not know exactly which neurons you recorded from. So this is supposed to be a solution for this. So we are in vitro, I would say we are there, so we can do it. We see here a passive electrode where dye was not released, and when we release the dye, we see there are lots of dye crystals coming out, which can stay in in vitro cells. But to get it to work on these probes in vivo, there's still a tiny bit left to go, so I'm hoping we will be able to finish at the state where this is practically useful, not just for our probes, but more generally useful. So another thing we have started to look into is how I can play around with PDOT to make hybrids. Because the conducting structure of PDOT can also be mixed with something else we would like to have on the electrode side. It doesn't necessarily have to be a drug. So we have started to look at conducting polymer hydrials. So we have chosen in this case to go for a synthetic hydrial. It's based on polydimethyl acrylamide. And we can dip coat this hydrogel on top of the probe. We can functionalize uh, an iridium oxide surface to covalently bind the hydrogel on top. Then this hydrogel is particularly nice because it has a benzophenone part, so we can photocross link the hydrogel so we only coat the electrode site. And then we polymerize P dot through the hydrogel. So the point here is that we do not use a counter ion in the electrode deposition, but the counter ion is provided by the hydrogel, which makes it, you can see we have the polystyrene sulfonate in the hydrogel. So this is what makes the P-dot network truly interpenetrating. 
So it's not a two-phase material anymore, it's actually a completely mixed material. So the photostructure, we can see it already works fairly nicely. So this is a 50 micron scale bar, so this is approximately 75 micron of electrode here. But we can now, with the proper clean room equipment, with the proper mask aligner, we can really go down to the same scale as these 20 micron uh, electrodes that I showed you before. So this is not at all a problem. So why would we want to do this? Well, one point is that hydrails are nice biomaterials. They have a lot of interesting qualities. So this particular hydrail is non-biofouling, meaning that if you want to make a sensor that is exceptionally stable, it might be nice to have this non-biofouling surface to prevent proteins from, from clogging on your sensor. But perhaps for neural interfaces, the more interesting quality is that it's not toxic, so cells can sit on the material, they don't adhere. But the thing is that we can now functionalize the hydrail with exactly those adhesion molecules that we want to have there, so we can select which cells that can adhere on this material. So thanks to the hydrail, we can prevent unspecific absorption of proteins and choose the ones we wish to have. As an electrode material, it behaves essentially as P.PSS, so it's not very different in any way. Uh, Stability-wise, it's fairly new, so we have not yet extremely long-term experience. What we have seen, we have measured impedance over one year, so stored samples in the incubator, in salt solution, and then at regular time intervals come to measure impedance and to measure a cyclic voltammogram. And we can see that there is some change over one year, so it's 340 days, so we are missing 25 days here to the year. There's some change, but there's not a, a large change, actually. It's a small shift. So we have to look into a little bit why there is still some loss of conductivity. But I would say this is not at all dramatic for, for a first attempt, and it's still a, quite a long measurement. We have also looked into how one can use this material again for drug release. So to do ion exchange, since it's very porous, we can now fill in other kinds of ions than we can into P.PSS. We have started to test this now with fluorescein first because it's very easy to detect fluorescein, it's very easy to work with. So we don't intend to use fluorescein as a drug, but it's a model for some kind of charged drug in similar size range as DEX. So what we see is that it, it, it works essentially the same as with P.PSS, but more. So we can soak in fluorescein, we can with a trigger signal decide when the fluorescein comes out, so either a lot of fluorescein or a little bit at a time depending on the trigger signal. And it also has not as strong binding of the drug as um, if we would mix PDOT and DEX, because there we mix DEX in from the beginning, now the fluorescein is filled afterwards. But even if we store these samples over four weeks in salt solution, after four weeks there is still uh, a little bit left to push out. So there is, of course, some leakage, but we have also some control. So we are working in the direction of having more control and less leakage, but it will take us a little bit more time to get there. But my main point of my talk today is, is something that is a bit new to me. So I want to tell you about um, the tortoise and the hare. It's a, it's a children's story. Uh, and um, the point with showing you this is that the point with this story is that the hare is very fast and the tortoise is not, but being fast is not the only thing that matters. So sometimes it's also good to be slow and show some stamina. That's what the tortoise does. So neurostimulation, I would say, is, is the hare. So um, we stimulate, we stimulate with very fast switching signals, but there's lots of interest currently in also stimulating with slower signals, not typically to trigger neuronal activity, but to influence how neurons work. So this we see, for instance, with the alternating current stimulation, and there are many interesting papers. I'm not going to go into depth into those because I'm sure many of you know this better than I, what one can use it for. This is just one example, so how transcranial ACS can be used to, um, with a 10 hertz frequency, influence how neurons work within the brain. And they actually, if you stimulate it with a 10 hertz frequency, they also respond with 10 hertz oscillations, and this could influence anything from occurrence of epileptic seizures, I learned yesterday, um, to memory, to um, other interesting effects. 
So what I'm interested in is the material, because one main problem for these applications is that the metal electrodes that we have, they are not good with slow signals. So the reason why metal electrodes work well with the fast switching pulses is that we can allow some faradic reactions on the surface because we immediately re retract the charge we just pushed out. So we reverse any reaction because we work in such a fast regime. The problem is with the slow signals because then we might have a buildup of corros corrosion products over time. So, with PDOT, this is not at all the case. Actually, PDOT excels in this slow region because of this thick bulk that I showed you. So this is just some of the newest data we have. So here we have 500 micron diameter electrodes. We have platinum, we have iridium oxide, and we have PDOT. And PDOT we can have in all kinds of thicknesses. So we actually we use deposition charge as a proxy for thickness. It's not essentially the same, but more or less. So a high deposition charge means a very thick pilot layer. And what we can see here is the maximal current that we can push out of the electrode. If we go, if we allow such a sinusoidal signal to go to the boundaries of the water window. So we have a 0.1 hertz signal, and we can see that for iridium oxide and for platinum, we have yeah, is it half for iridium oxide, the current, as we can for a th the thinnest layer of PDOT that we tried out? And the thicker we grow the PDOT, the more current we, we get out. So in principle, we can go to half a millimeter of a layer. We didn't try this, but we can go to extremely thick electrodes and get more and more current out in the slow, um, slow switching range. So this is very interesting on its own. So this means we can suddenly do new things with implanted electrodes that we couldn't do in the past without worrying about corrosion. We can in fact even drive DC current this way. So I think many of you would not believe that this is possible, but it is possible. So this experiment is done the way that we polarize the electrode to 0.45 volts. It's a three electrode setup. So we know that we have 0.45 exactly at the electrode site. And we have also here the comparison for platinum and iridium oxide. So then we measure for 2,000 seconds, so approximately half an hour. So how much transferred charge do we get? So iridium oxide and platinum, they're mo almost all of the charge is transferred in the beginning, and then there is, in principle, no more current flow. But for PDOT, depending on how thick it is, we can see we have more and more current. Still after half an hour, there is current coming out. And if we look here at the different thicknesses, so in principle, it's a linear effect. So the thicker the pilot layer, the more current we can get out, even after half an hour of driving current in one direction. Then, of, of course, after half an hour, we can also reverse it and refill the electrode. This is perfectly possible. So why would one want to do this? So I'm sure there are many reasons. So one reason that I'm interested in is electrotaxis. So electrotaxis is a corresponding thing to chemotaxis. So this is, seems to be one way that cells find their way when they migrate. So it can be used as a guidance cue. So there is this belief that there are electrical fields endogenously in the body during embryonal development and during healing of wounded skin. But in fact, there is also experimental data showing that if one applies exogenous fields, one can also control how cells migrate in culture, but also in tissue. So the problem until now has been that the materials we have had at hand cannot really do this in a suitable way. But PDOT can. So I'm going to show you, it's, it's quite ugly, it's not really a microsystem, but I want to show you because it's convincing. So these are very large PDOT electrodes. This is approximately one square centimeter of a PDOT electrode and connected with a micro channel here in between is 300 micron wide. And in this channel, I have cells that move a lot. So this is a rat prostate cancer cell line. So without an electrical field, they move randomly. When I apply the electrical field over the PDOT electrodes, the migration paths are aligned with the field. Even over two hours, I can do this. So the reason this experiment stops at two hours is because I did not have a, a, an incubated system for my time lapse. So after some point, uh, the cells are just more and more unhappy. But I can do it without the cells and show I can maintain this electrical field over 18 hours, which is quite exceptional. 
just with this very simple method. Of course, now this is very unpractical, so the electrodes are huge. So the question is, can I scale it down? And yes, I can. So I try to sketch here in scale some figures to show you how much we can scale this down. So if you're fine with doing just two hours, we can still use P.PSS and do DC stimulation for two hours at this field strength by scaling the electrodes down this much, as you see here. But if I can use one of these thick materials, for instance, the hydrial electrode that I showed, so which can be really thick and still is permeable all the way down to the bottom of the substrate, it's actually possible to scale this down to the scale where the electrodes are as small as the channel. So it's a one-to-one -one relationship, which means it's also possible to do DC stimulation of cells, even in tissue, actually even at these high field strengths, if one wishes to. So I'm hoping that I now have made some good arguments for why PDOT is still a very nice electrode material. So it can be good for recording, for stimulation, but it can also do other things. And in particular, when this adhesion problem is solved, one has access to all these other things. So it would not be possible to grow these very thick pedot films if we did not have good adhesion to the substrate. They would only fall off. But now with the rhenium oxide, actually the binding is so strong so that we have seen that when they fail, they pull the rhenium oxide off from the core rhenium. They don't fail at the interface, which speaks for that this is really quite strong, this bond between the two. So, as final slide, and to confuse you, I'm going to tell you that in Germany, it's not the tortoise that defeats the hare. It's, it's the hedgehog, actually. <laughs> and, and I'm telling you this not uh, to confuse you too much, but now I spent my half an hour talking about PDOT, but there is a poster from Christian Böhler later today or tomorrow. And he talks about uh, the hedgehog electrodes, or so platinum grass, different versions of this grass that also can be used to enhance electrode quality. So if you're very uncomfortable with polymer electrodes, maybe platinum grass is something for you. Then you can go and talk to Christian over at his poster number 16. And I'm sure he can also give you some convincing arguments for why there are more interesting electrode materials than PDOT. So I want to thank you all for listening. Um, especially now I know it's after lunch and some of us are very jet lagged. Um, I also want to thank the opportunity to thank my, my grant providers. So of course the Brain Means Brain Tools, um, very important for me, but now recently also the DRC, the European Research Co Council, which will sponsor this DC stimulation topic for me. And um, Freiburg Institute for Advanced Studies who made it possible to set up this DEX study in the first place. So thank you very much. <laughs>